Well, 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 boys and girls, it's that time again for another episode of Rim Shots with Sean, brought to you by Barstools and Band Talk. We have a uh, a return guest and a new guest. We've got the amazing Gray Chase on with uh, my new buddy, Jim Taft from Atomic Kings. Gentlemen, welcome. Hey, hey, thanks for having us back. So my friend Ian, who uh, is a bass player in my band, uh, is going to sit in on this because I figure um, when Jim and I start making the bass player jokes, Greg, you'll have a little bit of cover. So... Uh... <laughs> Are you sure you want to go that route? Doesn't even crack a smile. I love it. I Greg's love it. a big guy. I don't know about me, but Greg's a big dude. Yeah, yeah. He might manhandle you. So let's just jump right in here. So this album came out a few weeks ago. And when I talked to you before, Greg, Greg earlier, uh, you hadn't started to record it. You're on your way to record it. Uh, talk about the process, because you guys didn't do it in Phoenix, right? You went somewhere else to, to do the recording? Well, actually, the album isn't released until May 3rd. Okay. So what you got is an advanced copy. So we just got the first, we pre-sold 300 copies in five days. Amazing. Which is great because our record company didn't think we would pre-sale five or 50. So we <laughs> quadrupled that or whatever that is. So um, we just saw, whatever that means. So we just saw the CDs for the first time yesterday and we autographed 300 of them. And uh, now we all look like this. We have right <laughs> Yeah, yeah. But the 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 process, yeah, we did bass and drums in uh, uh, the guy that um, does Counts Customs that guitar show. I mean that car show. Uh, it's on cable, and he soups up, you know, buys cars, and then reconfigures them into like hot rods and that kind of stuff. He owns. A, he's a musician, Danny uh, Coker, and he owns a really nice studio in Vegas. Our label's based out of Vegas, and uh, we went up there, um, when did we go? About a year ago. Yeah. Oh, my God. A year ago. Yeah. Uh, me and Jimmy and uh, uh, Ryan went up there and recorded basic tracks in two days, and bass and drums, and some of them guitars. And then uh, Ryan came up one other time or two other times and recorded all the rest of the guitars. And then we did vocals in Phoenix. And... Uh, was kind of a interesting way of how we did it um kind of like you know just sending files back and forth i know that's the way people do it now but that's not the way i've ever done it right and i'm going to get in and in on a couple of questions here in a second because uh i i actually i sent him one of the tunes and then um you you guys started posting a few songs and one of the things and greg when we first were talking the last time you were talking about it's going to be kind of a, uh, a modern throwback and when i hear heard it i was like wow like riff rock at its finest i mean you know it 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 sounded like a throwback with a nice modern sort of flair to it yeah we uh we're, we kind of describe it as a 70s style hard rock riff rock with a modern twist so we're 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 very riffy. I, I'm I'm writing riffs all the time, and so we never have a shortage of things to work on. As a matter of fact, when we're doing the interview, we're, we're going to rehearse for the first time in three weeks. We have a new song based on just some crazy riffs that Ryan and I came up with, and we're going to get Jimmy in the process here uh, tonight. So I'm going to get Ian to jump in here in a second, but Jim, I, would, I did want to say one thing because Greg posted a video, and it must have been you, when you guys were in the studio um, when you first started. Um, I've always liked drummers who, I guess, um, surprised me. And you did it in the opposite. So it was a video of you kind of winding out. And you had some really nice chops going. It was a really nice thing. And I was like, okay, typically you see that after. Like, you hear the, you hear the music and you go, okay, well, that guy's pretty good. And then you see the chops and you go, wow, that guy can really play. When I heard the, the tunes, I'm sitting there going, man, this guy's really playing for the song. And I know he can do a lot more. Just speak about that for a little bit, because I mean, like what what you laid down there was some really groovy, cool stuff. Thanks, man. Um, listen, for me, it's about the piece. Um, you know, the the cool thing about the way that that we write. You know, I get my opportunities to, you know, shine here and there. Uh, but you know, I've I've never been a fan of of guys who overplay just for the sake of, uh-oh, I've I, there's a space here. I've got to throw something in it, you know? Um, I'm just a, I'm, I'm just a real big proponent of, of playing to the piece. And that's so, kind of where it begins and ends with me. And what, what do we call that, Greg, when you do that? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, quick story, quick story. 
uh, I interviewed you the first time, and I, I remember I told you I was reading, it was when you were in Badlands, it had to be 20 some odd years ago, and you used the term 10 pounds of baloney in a two pound oh, bag. Yeah. And I was just like, man, that's uh, that's it right there, right? That, that's how Ray would describe me, 10 pounds of baloney in a two pound bag. But <laughs> I'm not uh, a less is more kind of guy. Um, and even when I'm writing something, I always have the drums in mind or the guitar in mind. So um, there's always going to be, I'm like more is more if it works right. So, you know, one of my favorite drummers is Ian Pace, especially the vintage Ian Pace on like Machine Head or In Rock or, uh, you know, uh, any of that kind of stuff. Um, Burn, where he he's definitely got a lot more going on than what you would expect on a typical record, except he makes it all fit. And it doesn't sound like he's trying to squeeze in. Not he's not trying to shoehorn a four fifty four in a Volkswagen. So he's actually he's actually it, it, and now when you listen to uh, Deep Purple, what I miss is the fact that he doesn't play that way. Um, ever since probably uh, the one that had uh, when they did their reunion, whatever the name of that record is, Perfect Strangers, mm -hmm. he quit playing the way that he'd always played, and I actually kind of miss that style. So. When we're coming up with something, it's always in with something in mind that I like a, a fairly busy drummer. Although Jimmy makes a good point, it's always for the song, but there's always plenty of space to do stuff. I'm an extremely busy bass player, but it's in the context of what the song is. And the thing about the three of us musicians, me and Jimmy and, and uh, Ryan, is we know where the other guy is and we know how not to step on their toes. A funny story, like when I'm writing something and, and I present it to Jimmy, when we first started doing this a few years ago, he would throw everything in but the kitchen sink. And I'd be like, oh, my God, what's he doing? And what I learned over the course of us doing this so long is and early on, early on, I would say something. And he looked at me like I was crazy. What I learned is that he'll take it home and then he, he kind of. Uh, does stuff by subtraction. So he'll listen to everything that he had in there. So it's addition by subtraction. And then he starts taking out the stuff that he knows. I don't have to tell him, you know, hey, that part is that he knows already. And by the time I see him the second time that we're working on the track, he's got it sorted out. And it's an ongoing process as the song is being arranged and we're getting the final parts of it. By the time it's done, it's all 100% Jimmy Taft. He knows when to, when to you know, fold them and when to fold them so he, <laughs> he i never have to say anything to him he's usually 99.9 .9 of the time percent of the time by the time we're done he's he's got what i wanted anyway perfect mr fancy well there's an art in in that too like like when i hear when i hear greg's bass playing as busy as you just as you describe yourself greg i can't imagine the songs that you play on sounding any different like i i hear what you do as part of the melody as much as i hear the guitar or keyboards or anything else and I can't unhear that. And I, and I know it's not just because I'm a bass player and I'm listening for that. It's because what you choose, your no choices, where you leave space, where you get busy, it's all by design. I, I think that's really cool. And it definitely is a throwback to like 70s style bass playing. But I, well, I really miss that, you know, where you're just like, it seemed like in the 80s, everybody just played eighth notes under the guitar player. And that was it. Like you, it, that suited the song in some cases, but I really miss the movement. And, and when... Your former band, when Badlands came out, I was like, holy shit, there it is. That's that's what I'm missing. But that that 70s style movement, you know, you're you're creating part of the melody as much as anybody else is. So so very cool. Yeah. Um Thanks. back in the 70s, every band had a guy who kind of if this was the 70s, what I do would be just kind just of guy. yeah, I'd be just another guy. I'd just be like every other band, whether it's Sabbath or Grand Funk or Humble Pie or Free or or Wishbone Ash, or Cactus, all the bands, I, the Who, the bands I grew up with, Zeppelin, all of them guys, and every other band you can think of had a guy. The bass wasn't just an instrument that was dumbed down to where you just pedaled eight, eighth notes on the eighth string and maybe did like a little walking bass line for a second. I can't play that way. So when I got to L.A., I played the way that I play now, and, and I would go to audition for people, and they'd say, oh, wow. That's really cool. You're not going to do it, are you? <laughs> and I'd say, well, actually, yeah, and probably more. And the beauty of playing with Jake was when we first started doing Badlands, right out of the gate, he said, hey, uh, you do more right there? And I'd, 
I absolutely can. And so <laughs> he, he always gave me free reign to uh, kind of do the song the way that I heard it in my head. It's very similar to how we do it in, in the Kings is Jimmy has free reign to interpret the song the way he does the same with Ryan, the same with Ken. And I actually wouldn't have it any other way. I mean, what's the use of having a, a drummer as great as Jimmy or guitarist as great as Ryan, singer as great as Ken, if you're going to friggin' put a governor on them? You know, yep. you got to yep. let him do his thing because other than that, what's the use of having it? Yep. So, and that's part of what the creative process is, is what Jimmy brings to the table, what Ryan does, what I do, and what Ken does is everyone's saying what they want to say. So when we're writing, it's always in mind with us being able to say what we want to say, but in the context of the song. Awesome. We're going to take a quick break and pay some bills here, gentlemen. And uh, more to come with, uh, with Greg, with Jim, with Ian, with myself after this. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Rim Shots with Sean, brought to you by Barstools and Band Talk. We have Greg Chase on, we have Jimmy Taft, we have my buddy Ian Fancy. We're all here having some fun, chewing some fat. Um, so I guess we'll geek out for a second, Jimmy. When you did the when you guys did the tracks in the studio, um, obviously you were prepared. Uh, the click track, no click track, free form, live off the floor. How'd you guys do it? Yeah. Um <laughs> we decided against using a click. Um, and it was interesting uh, when it first came up, uh, it was it was really our producer's uh, idea uh, to not use it. Um, and initially I was thinking, wow, that's different. You know, um, I've done a lot of recording sessions and rarely have I been told you don't need to worry about the click, you know. <laughs> so um, that was pretty cool. Um I'm pretty comfortable with working with a with a click. Uh, I know how to push and pull against it, but I I'll tell you it was pretty freeing uh, not to have to have that sitting right here, you know, saying, "All right, you keep it together, young." Yeah, yeah. You know? well, so it, it was pretty, it was pretty fun. So, and I, I always when I talk to drummers and and I've I've experienced this myself. You got to put. You think it sounds cool. You go in and record it. You go like, what was I thinking? This doesn't fit at all. And you finally hear it record. <laughs> Did you have any of those moments when you were in there? No. Um, one of the things that we do um, when we're writing and working on pieces is we keep a recorder going. And so we each take the stuff home. Um, and what I tend to do um, when it comes to, okay, we're rolling, you know, we're rolling, um, I've, I've pretty much got everything mapped out, although I do leave um, certain spots in each song where I want to just kind of wing it uh, because I want the the moment to kind of help pull me through some stuff. So there are there are a few fills um, in that record that were off the cuff. Um, and I've, I've pretty much done it like that. It's about just about every session I've ever done. And in the words of Bob Ross, there's no mistakes. There's just happy accidents, right? So <laughs> Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> the funny part is we when we were signing all the CDs yesterday, uh, the guy that owns the label, our producer, uh, Jason Constantine from Tone House Records, was there. And he was talking about that exact thing. that He put Jimmy on an actual click to see how much he, uh, you know, deviated from the, the actual click and he says it was never more than two beats either way on any song and that to me that's just the song breathing i mean i can't hear the click it's never in my phone phone so i'm just listening to him and if i had to play to a click i couldn't do it uh even as a bass player it'd be like get that out of here but i mean jimmy's the click for me so but i always can tell there's a song on the record called take my hand and it's one take we did it in one take and there's a part where it's going from one section into this kind of kind of we call it the evil's easy top part this boogie thing and then it comes back out of it into the main riff of the song and jimmy nailed it in one take and i said and that, that our, our producer said you want to do another one i said no i said this is perfect it was spot on let's not mess with it let's just move on on the record every song on there is probably no more than three, and probably most of them are two takes. That's how nice. we first started. Nice. Ian. Yes, sir. Um, well, now, now that it's all in, uh, now that it's all done, all the recording's done, 
Um, what are prospects for playing live and, and taking and taking the whole thing on the road, Greg? Like what we're all seeing, I guess, the economics of everything for for even huge established bands being sometimes compromised by by the state of things right now. Uh, is there a plan to tour the album and, and get out there and do your thing live? Well, I, we couldn't tour in the traditional sense. I mean, Jamie has a business. Uh, Ryan and I here work, work here at Bizarre Guitar. Uh, Ken has his own business as well. We right. could do limited amount of fly-in dates. As a matter of fact, um, June, I think it's June 7th, we're going to New Mexico to open for uh, King's X. June 8th. June 8th. Oh, sorry. Cool. June 8th. Nice. So uh, we're going to New Mexico to open for King's X. I know we're going to do a show in Vegas. Uh, we'll probably do something in California. We haven't figured it out since the record hasn't actually dropped. Uh, the response has been great, but who knows what's going to happen after that. So right. we'd be open to, you know, I mean, Fly us to Nova Scotia. We'll do a show. <laughs> well, and, 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 and Greg, and you might not know this, Ian, but Greg's got some ties to to, to yeah. New Brunswick, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. It, I believe your mother was from St. John. My my dad was from dad. St. John. My mom's from Halifax. Halifax, yeah, oh, right on. That's right. Yeah. So my grandma from PEI. And we we did say the last time, if you can find out the address in Halifax, we'll really get a picture for you. And, so much development going on here now, man, that I don't even know. Probably be an apartment building or something now. It's no great. Doubt. No doubt. Um, so uh, to that point, I mean, you know, uh, it's pretty cool. You know, you're, you're, you know, I'm not going to say name dropping. I mean, those are established bands that you get to, to work for. Um, you know, like to talk about networking and stuff. And I always talk about how important it is to different people. Obviously, Greg, you, you've got a network from before. Are you Are you able to drill into that to get some of these shows? How's that coming about? Uh, yeah, somewhat. I mean, because we're, this is the first record and we're primarily a new band, even though Jimmy and, and uh, Ryan and I played in a band together before, but this is a brand new thing and uh, it's just, just on its own merit. Um, I haven't really, I mean, I haven't really reached out to see what I could do. I mean, I have friends in other bands and I mean, if Jake was going to play somewhere with uh whatever if, if red dragon cartel is around i'd see if i could hop on that bill and i'm sure you know my jake's my best friend i'm pretty sure that could possibly happen but i don't know what he's doing at this point um so you know once the record's out and we see what the response is um some people may come calling i mean we opened for ace fraley a year ago and that was just on the strength of their sound man seeing our show in the parking lot of the store here. We do a free show once a year out in the parking lot. And he happened to see it and said, said it would only sound better if I ran your sound. And I said, <laughs> you know, and, he, and he goes, how would you like to open for Ace Fraley? And I went, well, okay. Yeah. So, I mean, we're open to whatever, as long as it uh, doesn't cost us too much money. And uh, I, I know we're going back to uh, Albuquerque again to play, the weekend after Thanksgiving to play uh, the New Mexico uh, guitar show there. And so I know we will be going back to headline that. And so um, I have a friend there that owns a guitar store, Muzzle Guitars, and he also does a uh, uh, promotions thing there. So we're going to go and do a show there. So I would imagine we would do a couple shows a year anyway in New Mexico. He, The guy that owns it, uh, Eddie Cantu, used to be our manager. So we have a good solid connection there. I know people in other bands and also our uh, our record label, Jason Constantine. He knows a bunch of people as well. So I think it's kind of whatever we can afford to do. I mean, we're not in this to make money because then that's fortunate because there is any isn't any. <laughs> and, but, you know, we don't want it. We don't want to bankrupt ourselves to do it either. We believe in what we do and we'd like people to hear it. But it's got to be there's got to be a reason for it. It's got to make sense. So we got about uh, 30 seconds. Ian, if you got a quick question before the end of this segment, lob her out there, my friend. A question? Uh, 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 who made your new bases, Greg? I know they're custom. Oh, they're yeah. My buddy Greg Mara uh, at GJM Guitars, he um, showed a picture online of a guitar he made. And I said, do you make a bass? He said, I would for you. And so uh, I kind of helped him design what I wanted. I picked the wood for it and everything. And I said, how much do you want for it? He said, I'm going to make it for you. Uh, wow. you'll, you'll be my only bass player artist. For some inexplicable reason, I'm his favorite bass player. <laughs> the guy's obviously touched. <laughs> he has no judge of character. He's got good taste. So, good so he made it. And here's the cool part. 
I even said, you want me to get pickups? No, I'll, I'll get them. You want me to get, get strings? Because I have deals with DR and with Seymour Duncan. And he says, no, I'll get all that stuff. And not only did he make the base, he drove out here from California and delivered it. Wow. That's awesome. You know what? Next segment, we'll get a shout out to him. We're going to take a quick break. We're going to come back after. Hey, you know, we got to pay some bills. We're uh, we're a big time po- podcast on a small time budget. So we're going to be back after this. <laughs> Aren't we all? Well, folks, welcome back to Rim Shots for Sean, brought to you by Barstools and Van Talk. And I forgot to mention on Eastlink TV. So that's uh, pretty cool up here in Canada, Greg and, and Jim. That's uh, kind of a, a national thing. So um, and if you like what you're seeing, and I'm sure you do, hit the subscribe button. So, um, Greg, just give a shout out to your guy that you were talking to, because you just did it quickly, but the, 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 your guy that, that made the base for you, who he is, what he does, and where he's from. Greg Mara. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, Greg Mara, and he's in, uh, I think he's based in Oxnard, California. The company is GJM Guitars, and he makes some really uh, interesting, very playable, great sounding, uh, one. he kind of does them by hand, and it's, you know, Everything is very well done. As a matter of fact, I'm going to have him make me a second base. And uh, then the other guy I need to really give a shout out to uh, is uh, Crunch Cabinets and Cables. And Mike Lucero, um, he made my cabinets that you see me using, those green uh, 415 Crunch Cabinets, and they are uh, super cool. So uh, I will be using them on any show that we do, and I've used them on every show we've done so far. So. Awesome. Nice. Uh, so, Jim, I'm going to put it over to you. I mean, uh, you know, every, every drummer obviously loves to play with great singers and good singers. You guys have a great one there. I mean, uh, when when I, I saw the parking lot thing uh, that you guys did a, a number of months ago, uh, you know, great singer. Uh, his voice sounds even more distinctive on the recordings that I heard. Uh, you know, trying to sit there and go, who does he sound like? I can't really put my finger on who he sounds like. Talk about him for a second, because he's really doing some great stuff on that recording. You know, it's funny. Um I, I go way back with Ken. Uh, in fact, we we played in another band together. Gosh, I hate to even say it, but it was in about the, 30 in the, years in ago. The 40s. <laughs> in the 40s. Back in the 40s. <laughs> right after the war. <laughs> right after the war. Um, and so it, I knew what he was capable of. Um, and when it came time for us to to find a singer, he really was the guy who we were all zeroed in on. Um uh, he's been around uh, the valley here. He's kind of a local legend, if you will. Um, and super, super cool guy. Um, extremely well liked. Um, uh, but when it comes to his 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 vocal, his approach, um, his overall tone, um, he's an absolute perfect fit for what we do. And listen, you've you mentioned it yourself. You heard it on the record. Um, it, it was truly the icing on the cake. We felt like musically we had something. We we were we were firing on all eight. And when we brought him in, it was just oh man, it was just absolutely perfect. And it's really hard to to say exactly who he sounds like because you know he's he draws from a lot of different influences as we all do. You know, so it's 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 kind of hard to say. I mean, you'll. You know, at times you'll hear a little bit of a Paul Rogers thing in him, and I know he's a huge fan of Paul's. Um, but you know, there's a couple of spots on that record where, you know, you could you could probably think of some other pretty pretty influential guys that uh, that uh, left and left a mark on him. So, yeah, it's, I don't know. He's he's the man. It's he's funny great. because we we had written songs and and we had we're going through a different situation and we, we kind of brought Ken in. I called him up and I, uh, we actually had a singer. We let the singer go. And, um, Jimmy said, well, who are we going to get? I said, Ken Ronk. And I didn't know he knew Ken, but Ken and I had been talking about doing some kind of cover project just for the fun of it. And we'd got together and rehearsed a couple of times and we hit it off really good. And I really liked his voice and he's, literally the nicest guy you'll ever meet, which completely counterbalances what a prick I am. So <laughs> it works great. So Ken's the most liked singer. He's probably the most liked musician in, in Phoenix. I don't know. I don't know anyone. I've never heard a bad word said about him other than what I say. But um, he came in and sang some of this material. And like, all I want was a song that we had written early on. 
And as soon as he sang it, I looked over at Jimmy and we were both like, uh, this is what it's supposed to sound like. And from that point on, we were like rolling at that point. Awesome. Ian, over to you. Yeah, I, I can hear I can hear Paul Rogers, Steve Marriott, you know, oh, wow. YouTube. I can hear maybe a little humble, um, a little grand funk. I definitely, I, sure. I definitely hear his, his love of Paul Rogers for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Great, yeah. great singer and great tunes, guys. Like super, super. And he cool. plays a mean harp. Yes, he does. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Um, so gear, Greg, what about amplification? What do you like to use live? Are, are you guys using like in ears? Are you, are you using? <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Sean, Sean and I are both feeling that one. Yeah. Um, so, so, so you mentioned the crunch cabinets, four fifteens in that bad boy. Wow. Four, uh, four twelves, four twelves, four twelves okay. and they're, uh, uh, Celestia Neo speakers. So there's yep. four twelves in each one. And then I'm using an Ampeg SVT classic head. Nice. And, uh, that's what my main head is. Uh, if we were like, when we go to, to New Mexico coming up here in June 8th, <laughs> um we're jimmy has a trailer so we're bringing all our own stuff jimmy has his noble and cooley kit here and he likes to play on that kit and it's a specific way that he sets up so whenever possible we bring our own stuff and uh but if we flew in i have a uh aguilar uh 700 or whatever it's called it's called it. aguilar ag or ac 700 it's just oh, a small like little, little class d head yeah but it yeah. sounds killer, and yeah, I and I use awesome. a tube screamer anyway, so I have a tube screamer on the SVT or on the Aguilar, nice. and I can pretty much get my sound. I have a certain sound that I like that's kind of like my thing. I can get it just on anything, so works good for me. Very cool. So it, it, and we're, we're loud. We are friggin' loud. <laughs> proper, proper. If we're, if we're if we're playing hockey here, it'd be like we were throwing the sticks in the middle and picking sides. So I'm gonna I'm gonna throw one over to Jim. The bass players have clearly united. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> you you uh, you did that record. So uh, you mentioned double chord. And I actually had an opportunity to play a set of those drums. They're beautiful drums. On now on this record, um, did, is that what you used in the studio, or did you uh, did you use a house kit that was there? Oh no, I took the nobles. Oh yeah. In fact, I, it was funny, you know, we talked a little while ago about uh uh we were doing the signing for the CDs just uh, last night and our producer uh, Jason Costa team was there. And after uh after, you know, all of that was done, we were talking about the the session. And uh he says uh he goes I got to tell you that that kit is hands down the best sounding kit I've ever recorded. And this is a guy who actually has recorded Bonham's sparkle green kit. Nice. Uh, and he said, what was amazing to him is the fact that he didn't have to do much to it. Um, did almost no EQing on the toms. Uh, it just, it's, it's just a naturally unreal sounding kit, huge. Uh, and he's and he's like, he goes, yeah, I remember the, the first day uh, after you guys left, I, I went to my wife and I said, I, I, I've, I've got to get a Noble and Cooley kit. I've got to have one, you know. And I mean, he had that kit custom made. I it's, it's a custom made kit. He called him up and said, because he has another Noble yeah. kit, yeah. said, make me this. No. That's awesome. Oh, that's so you know, I I can't I can't believe that we're almost done here. But what I want to do before we wrap, um, I've had a lot of people. I've shared this album. I didn't I didn't give it right because people have to buy it, but I let people hear it because um, you know people you know you guys got to get paid right. But I did I did a couple little teasers and stuff. Where are my viewers uh, going to be able to get this and find it and and, uh, and get their hands on it? You can go on Tone House Records. Um, and they sell it there along with merchandising. There's a whole line of merchandising, whether it's hats, T-shirts, stickers. You can buy that stuff there, and it's shipped directly to you. So you can get the CD there. You could also – it's going to, The whole record will be available on all streaming yeah, services. Yeah, on, on May 3rd is the drop date, yeah. so you could get it on any streaming services, including uh, just getting an MP3 of it. And you could find us on our Atomic Kings Facebook page, you can get it from us there. Uh, we'll sign it for you. Uh, we'll ship it to you. And uh, there's Atomic Kings Band Instagram page that has a, a lot of information on it as well. So uh, there's a number of places you can get it, but May 3rd is the day. And uh, we're 
Looking forward to it. Yeah. Well, Greg Chason, Jim Chap, Ian Fancy, I'm Sean. Thanks a lot for tuning in, guys. Uh, good luck, boys. I I love what I heard. I I I was raving about it, and that's uh, you know, I like what I like. No uh, no bones about it, and uh, fit right in nice into my collection. So uh, great job. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys.